So what's universal JavaScript? What does it mean? Is it supposed to run on the ISS? Unfortunately not. I, I would love to, but um, I don't know if they execute JavaScript. Maybe. The term is used to describe a special type of web application. It means that the application code is written in a way that it can be executed both on the server and on the client. So how does it work? The server renders the, the initial HTML and sends it to the browser. The browser displays the initial HTML and simultaneously it also downloads a single page app in the background. And once the client side code is ready, the client takes over and the website becomes a single page application. And this process is called rehydration or just hydration. We didn't really settle on the term. So why would you want to do that in the first place? So the reason number one is performance. Because with, with server-side rendering, the first meaningful paint happens sooner. And actually we're leveraging one of HTML's strength, progressive rendering. And browsers are incredibly good at rendering partial content because back in the days we had slow internet connections and uh, so the browser started to render content as soon as it was available so we can start reading without, for instance, waiting for the images. But with, with single page applications, we throw all these built-in performance optimizations away. Why are we doing it? So the second reason is SEO. So search engine crawlers used to not to execute scripts. But nowadays, they do, but they just execute the initial scripts. So if there's a script um, pending or there's something like you have to wait for something for too long, they stop. And it's roughly about uh, 10 seconds, but you don't really know. It's, it could change. And you know search engine crawlers, there are different search engines, and you just don't know. And an another problem is that um, single page applications can't set meaningful HTTP status codes. So usually you will just send uh, 200. And I think the, the, the reason number three is error, error resilience. So if something goes wrong, the website stays usable. So even if scripts weren't loaded, blocked, or failed in some other way, there are a lot of ways how scripts can fail, but an HTML page with just CSS is a lot more error resilient. So the idea is not really new. Back in 1995, Netscape also released a server-side uh, JavaScript implementation, which they called LiveWire. And it looked something like this. So I uh, copied that example from the documentation. You would have um, like these server tags. It's a bit like PHP. And then you can execute some JavaScript code and then this code is executed on the client. But the idea didn't really take off. So when I was preparing the talk, I came across this uh, comment. I spent 18 months during LiveWire development, and it's pretty lame. I hit the wall of scripting languages limitations quickly, and even though LiveWire and Enterprise Server 3 added a lot of stuff, it still sucks. For this reason, I have dedicated a whole page on my personal site to describing why LiveWire sucks. Random developer in 1998. So apparently, they didn't really change. And that's because universal JavaScript can be very challenging. It's really complicated. So um, I decided to, um, to show some of the, um, the pitfalls that you will encounter when you, when you uh, try to implement this kind of web application. So let's start the journey. And I tried to explain it by, uh, so we have a single page application and we transform it to a universal JavaScript implementation. And I described the journey, but the journey is pretty long and I had to um, skip some parts. So if you want to read it up, you can follow the link here and follow the whole story, but I just um, send, uh, show some of the conclusions here. And also another note, the following solutions are just my recommendation. There are different possibilities how you could solve and they, uh, they all have uh, valid use cases. So um, it's just my personal opinion and you can talk to me afterwards. I'm really interested in what you think about that. 
And another note, um, if you try out the example project in the repository, you won't be able to measure big performance differences. And that's because uh, universal applications are better when the JavaScript payload is really big and you have weak CPUs. CPUs. So the example project is a little bit too small to get um, good numbers there, but um, just as a side note. So our current single page app, um, I wrote an app that displays a random fox images, image. So when you go on the website, it, no, it loads a nice uh, background. By the way, that's the um, forest I was living in. It was really cold. It was not a jungle, by the way. And so it just fetches a random uh, fox image and displays it. The tech stack is React, uh, Babel, and Webpack, but that doesn't really matter. You can apply the learnings to different tech stacks as well. I just chose, uh, chose them because they are um, most familiar with. So we have a server JS. Um, this is basically an express server. So we have the uh, API route that takes um, the get request for the Fox image. It calls await fetch for, uh, on the remote API and sends the response to the, the client. We have to do that because we can't do cross-origin requests in the browser. And then that this is typical for a single page app. You just respond to all other um, requests with a 200 and send the initial HTML. So we have also this uh, app.js, it's a single app component. Uh, when, the com uh, when the component is mounted into the DOM, the client requests the image from our Express server, uh, which proxies it to the remote API. And as long as the API call is pending, we display a loading message. So we have this, this um, ternary statement here. And then we have a start.js, which imports the app component, calls React DOM render, and renders it into the DOM. So that's our example single page application. So the first challenge we encounter is the node, node browser gap. In Node.js, we have the common JS module system, and we have core modules like the file system, the HTTP module. In the browser, we don't have common JS. We uh, soon get ECMAScript modules in production ready. Some of the browsers already support it, but we don't have any core modules. It's like a bunch of um, globals, and they are not aligned with the Node core modules. So the good news is both platforms are getting more and more similar. So for instance, this type of code can be soon can be executed in both platforms. Once we have ECMAScript modules, and uh, there's also this URL constructor, which is implemented for both platforms. So if it makes sense to have it on both platforms, people try to align the en environment as good as possible. But the bad news is, we're not there yet. So, if we take a look at our app.js that I just presented, it's neither executable in the browser nor in Node. So, for instance, if we take a look at the import statements, there's this um, bare import spec specifier, which is the React, when there's no um, slash or um, dot in front of it, just React. And this is not even standardized yet, so we couldn't use that in a browser now. And of course, importing images is also not standardized. It's a Webpack feature, and there was some specification efforts in the loader spec, but things are still in flux, so um, we can't really rely on that. So maybe it's coming in the future, but you don't know. And we also have this custom syntax like JSX, or in Vue.js we also have few files, uh, which makes developing these kind of web applications easier, but now we need a build tool to, to translate these languages. So what's the solution for this? You can 
use a bundler to streamline the, mo streamline the module system and the platform environment. And the trick is to create a bundle for the browser and for Node. So when you're using Webpack, you can, instead of just passing, uh, exporting one configuration object, you can export two configurations, one web config and one node config. And this switches Webpack into the multi-compiler mode. So in the web config, we specify the target web, which is the default anyway. It means that the output should be executable in a browser. But we also have this node config where we specify target node, which means it should be executable in node. And we also have to specify that the, um, that the output should be a common JS module. And so you, you set lab library target common JS2, which is not, I don't know why it's common JS2, but yeah, picking names is hard. And we, as a, a little performance optimization, we can also um, specify the externals option, which means that Webpack will not look into node modules at all, because we don't need to touch these files. They are usually just ready for consumption. So we just skip it. And there's this nice NPM module, it's called Webpack node externals, which makes this configuration easier. Another, another way is to um, write isomorphic modules, how I call them. So for instance, there's this isomorphic fetch, which just takes care that we can use fetch on both platforms. And they do it by specifying different entry points depending on the environment. So there's the main for node and the browser field for browser. And this is really great because then you can start to, to um, implement modules that provide some functionality that can be executed both on the client and on the server. And you can publish it on NPM and other people can use it as well. So if you discover you can do that, please do that, because then you can share all the code. So the second challenge is the client-server gap. So on the client, it's a single user environment. We just have one user that's using our app. On the server, we have multiple users. So the server has to serve multiple users at the same time. But there's also another difference between these two environments. The client updates the DOM as soon as there is a, an update in the application, and the server does no updates, it just sends the HTML as soon as it is ready. So how can we, how can we solve that? You should keep the process stateless, which means, means that you have to maintain the application state for each request. You can't just put things into the global module scope th that are user dependent, you need to pass the, this application state through the whole application. So in general, you try to, to design the app in a way that it can be used by multiple users at the same time. And this is kind of a um, mind shift again from single page application. Another, another way is to create two app entries. So we have a client and a server app entry and that's the that's the place where you can put platform-specific uh, or environment-dependent code. So in our case, we could split up the start JS into start server JS and start client JS. So on the server, we now we need to export a function because we need to uh, create a new uh, HTML string on each incoming request, and we call this re React DOM server render, uh, render to string. Then inside the index HTML JS, where we render the initial uh, index HTML, we import the, the server bundle that we just created. And then we call the, the function, and the function returns a string, and then we can embed that into the index HTML template. And on the client, in the client, start client JS, we we call Reactom Hydrate with the, um, with the um, component, and then React uh, synchronizes the, uh, our application state with the, with the rendered HTML. And now that we have two different entries, you need to 
um, adjust the Webpack config accordingly. The next challenge is data fetching. So data fetching now needs to be executable on both the client and the server. Why? Because the initial request will be handled on the server and subsequent requests, which I call navigation events, will be handled on the client. And we need to remember that the initial request can be any route. So, for instance, if you send another, uh, another person a link, then the user might not start with the first initial state, so it might just start with any state. So how could you solve that? So for instance, you can use node fetch to make the fetch API available in node, and you just call fetch. You always need to remember that when the data fetching is executed on the client, we can't do cross-origin requests, what, which we can do in node, but we can't do on the client. So we always need to proxy all the requests via our own API. And that we also have to use absolute URLs to fetch the data from our own API. And this is the place where you might be thinking, oh, there's, that's weird. Why do we have to use absolute URLs? Yes, your server may end up doing HTTP requests against itself. This is really surprising, but it's fine, really. <laughs> it, it sounds counterintuitive, but then you can, uh, later you can decide to separate the, uh, the API from your application, and then your app still works. And as long as you don't have any performance bottleneck, it's fine. But if you're using GraphQL, for instance, you can circumvent that so it does not do an HTTP request. Uh, it just um, calls some functions to fetch the data. But there's also another problem. When we, ex uh, when we visit the page, we get this state. So in the HTML, we see that uh, we're currently in the loading state, not in the final state with the data. So we have to... Um, this is because the, uh, in, in componented, moment, uh, com componented mount, the, um, we, we, we have an asynchronous function, but the rendering is synchronous. So when the server sends out the HTML, the app is still fetching. The solution for this? You may be thinking maybe multiple render passes, uh, but that feels kind of hacky. I think the better approach is to separate the data fetching from the rendering entirely. So you turn that async function, um, um, component function method into a static function. And instead of calling set state, you just return the state. And this is uh, pretty similar to what Next.js is doing with, um, they call it get initial props. And on the server, start server.js, you call await app fetch data, you wait for the initial data, then you render the application and send out the string. And now we have the, uh, the final HTML, which brings us to the next challenge. State dehydration and rehydration. Because when we, when we now visit the application, we see a warning in the, in the console. It says that the, um, that the rendered HTML does not align with the state we are trying to render. And that's true, because on the server we have initial props, and that's what we are sending to the client. And the client now tries to hydrate the app with no initial props. So the, the application state does not match the HTML now. So we somehow need to make the props from the server available to the client. And we can do that by changing our start server.js to not just return the HTML string, but also the state. And then we can adjust the index HTML JS to, to stringify the state and put it on any window property preload state. But now there's a that's the X, XSS alarm going on. So we have a cross-site uh, scripting vulnerability now. Why is that? You need to remember that the state may contain user data that is controlled by the user. And if the user decides to put them some HTML into it, 
then we may end up with this state. And now the browser sees this kind of HTML and it sees, oh, the script tag is closing, and there's another script tag, and then it just executes it. So you can circumvent that by replacing all the, um, the opening brackets with the Unicode um, counterpart. And this prevents this kind of hack, uh, attack. Now on the client we can reuse the preloaded state, we pick it from the window object and we uh, call, we, we instantiate the app component with the initial props and now everything is working again. Which brings us to the next challenge, the uncanny valley. So the uncanny valley in server-side rendered apps means that the website looks usable, but it does not respond to user interactions. So it's kind of frustrating. You're trying to click something and it doesn't really respond to you because the shell script isn't loaded yet. So I stole this infographic from Paul Lewis. He described it pretty well. So when the HTML arrives, there's this um, time span um, until the JavaScript is parsed and evolved. And this is the uncanny valley. And it's typically caused by big JS response sizes, so the HTTP response is big, but also the parse size after it has been decompressed and it's, it's, it is processed by the browser. So we need to take care of both these sizes. They, they do matter. And if they are big, the uncanny valley gets really big. The solution for this? Of course, if you replace unnecessarily big dependencies, you get a smaller bundle size, that's always good. And you should also delay dependencies that are not immediately required, and you can do that with the import function. And so Webpack sees that this um, dependency is not used immediately, you can load it lazily. And the last trick is to just use anchor tags instead of click handlers. So the goal is, while the scripts are being loaded and parsed, our web ap application should already be usable. It should just be a website with HTML and CSS. Which means that every meaningful UI state should have a URL. So for instance, if you want to open a, mod a modal, you should not use a click handler. You can use a, uh, a URL with a query parameter. So you go on example.com and then you, you want to open the modal, it refers to another URL, and, and so on. So that's how you could solve it. And this allows the server to fill in for the client when it's not ready yet. It just takes over the, the rendering. And there are also other advantages. For instance, the back button just works. You don't have to do anything. It's just a website. And also open a new tab just works. And I think this um, also leads to better accessibility. So, but we, we do want to have a single page application, uh, application. so in the start client JS, we, you can for instance use this library, it's called nano href, and it captures all the, the clicks on anchor tags. So you can, you, you can listen to them and do the client side rendering. And this is where the client takes over when it's ready. The next challenge is response streaming. Because there's a problem now. As long as we're waiting for the data to be loaded, we just keep the client pending for now. So in this example, I've delayed the response time artificially to demonstrate the effect. You see that the uh, index HTML is taking very long, and we're not doing anything at all. We're just showing a blank page to the user. So we could already use, uh, we could already um, send all the static parts of our uh, of our application, so the user can start to download download all these static assets. So we need to write the server entry in a way that it allows it to send out parts of the document as soon as they are final. So if we change our start server JS into an object that returns a bunch of promises, for instance, the status code, the chunks that are being uh, loaded dynamically the document title, and of course the HTML in the state. Then we have to adjust the, the index HTML.js, 
where first, of course, we need to await the status code. We can't do anything because we, we, if we send out the HTML, we can't uh, change the status code later. And then we can, for instance, use this uh, nice NPM package. It's called stream template. And it creates a node stream from a template literal. And if you pass in any promises, it waits for them to be resolved. And we pipe that to the response. And here we just pass in the promises. So everything is resolved in the correct order. Now the, the network tab looks like this. So while the, we are waiting for the remote API or for the data to be loaded, we already send the client JS to the, to the user. But there are also further challenges that I, um, I couldn't cover in this um, talk but just show what um, I discovered so far. So long-term caching is also a problem if you're using URLs with, with hashes. And the trick here is to use the Webpack Assets manifest. It creates a manifest JSON, and then you get the mapping from the original source file name to the, um, to the output file name with the hash. You also need to remember that there are not only get requests, also post, put, patch, and delete. And you could use a or just a regular form with a method, but then of course you need to take care that um, the the form um, doesn't allow other requests than get and post. So there's this uh, method override middleware for Express, and it allows to um, it allows other methods than post. On the client, you listen for the submit events on, on the document, and you handle just these submit events uh, on the, on the client. So when the client is ready, we have this nice single page application experience. When the client is not ready yet, we just do regular server-side rendering. And your um, router needs to take care of these, of course. Now you also need to remember that we are uh, vulnerable for the uh, cross-site request forgeries, and you need to add a protection for that as well. But that's like, um, like all old-school web applications had to do. There are also um, other status codes like uh, redirects, errors, um, and you need to handle them on the client and on the server in the appropriate way. So on the server, you send out the status code uh, or do a location change, and on the client, the, it, the calls are different, but the functionality is, uh, is the same. There's also another challenge when you have um, authentication. So you need to make sure that the server, when it get, receives a cookie from our API, you need to forward that to the client so the client gets the actual cookie. And there you need to make sure that you don't accidentally, accidentally share cookies between different users. There are other things that you should take a look at. Um, so you don't have to write everything for yourself. You can uh, use um, solutions that are already out there. So for instance, there's uh, Wrestle, which is um, kind of framework agnostic. Uh, it's really nice. It's um, it doesn't um, it doesn't um, require you to to have a certain application structure. It just takes care of the uh, of the um, configuration, which can be yeah time consuming and and there's uh, of course there's Next.js, uh, which is pretty good. Um, it's for React. There's also After.js, which is a mixture between Next.js and uh, React Router. There's also Next.js for Vue.js, <laughs> and uh, if you if you like reading scientific papers, you can also read my master's thesis, um, which I put the link here. It's about universal JavaScript. So happy hacking and thank you.